All right, so how many folks know something about WinLink? How many people have used WinLink? Okay, how about, how about Packet Radio? Okay, how about uh, PSK31? It's about the same group. Okay, all right, that gives me an idea where to, where to kind of go with things. So um, we got just a, a brief slides here that we'll go through, but uh, somebody's already done all the work for me in terms of trying to discuss what WinLink is. So we got about a 20, 22 minute video that goes over everything that you can do with it and such. So um, what it is, it's basically a worldwide system for sending uh, email over the radio. Um, provides email from almost anywhere. Uh, supports up to, uh, well, uh, the, the number is, is probably, that, that got pulled off of Windling site. So about 10,000 plus mariners that are out there and it's adopted for contingency communication by many government agencies. Um, and we'll see a lot of that in the, in the video here and everything. So I'm gonna just kind of kind of throw through these real quick and, uh, and we'll get to the video here. In today's program, we hope to help you better. So as we go along, if you have questions during the video, throw your hand up and I'll try to race back here and, and pause it. We'll take them. ...understand the WinLink system by telling you about the message types, the pathways they take, and the modes required to do it in the WinLink global radio messaging system. WinLink started in the late 1990s and is also known as the WinLink 2000 network. WinLink is an all-volunteer project of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, which is a nonprofit public benefit corporation. What really is WinLink? In its simplest terms, WinLink is a worldwide system for transferring email via radio. WinLink has global connectivity. These maps show some of the many RMS stations worldwide. WinLink also has a wide range of users. WinLink has traditionally been associated with amateur radio. This includes the casual ham operator using the system for its everyday email. It also includes amateurs that volunteer their services in many other organizations. In this program, all of the examples we will look at are based on the amateur radio users. Another major user of WinLink is emergency communications. These include groups using WinLink for local, state, national, and international emergencies. The redundancy, flexibility, and off-grid independence built into the WinLink system make it a strong player in the emergency communications environment. A lesser known group of WinLink users are city, state, and our national government. And this also is true both within the United States and for governments around the world. Also included in this category would be many allied agencies helping with government operations. They have all learned that WinLink gets the emails through when other operations are not available. <clears throat> For the general public, maybe one of the least known users of WinLink is Maritime. WinLink is used at sea for email, position reporting, and receiving valuable weather information. These are all features that are built into WinLink's RMS Express software. Search and Rescue have also used WinLink communications to successfully get to distressed ships when normal voice operations were not possible. Here is the big picture view of the transfer paths in the WinLink system. It consists of amateur radio stations, also known as ham operators, which originate and receive email. RMS stations, and CMS servers. So let's take a closer look at the actual operation of the WinLink system. The first thing we need to look at are the different types of messages sent as WinLink email. WinLink operates primarily on software developed for the system by the WinLink development team. The software is called RMS Express. There are other softwares that can be used with the system like Outlook, AirMail, PackLink, and BPQ, but RMS Express is what is recommended. When you create an email message in the RMS Express program, 
you create it as a Winlink message or a peer-to-peer -peer message. If you create a Winlink message, the assumption is that there will be one or more hops between the message originator and the end user. A WL2K message will be addressed to a call sign at winlink.org. It can also be addressed to any standard internet email address if it's to be delivered outside the WinLink system. And finally, the subject line has to start with forward slash forward slash WL2K. The other type of message is peer-to-peer. -peer. This is a direct message between two radio operators. In this case, the only thing that needs to be in the address line is the call sign of the recipient. In this example, it's K4 REF. Once a type of message is chosen, we can now choose an automated session that is going to be used to send that message. As you can see, there are both WL2K sessions and peer-to-peer -peer sessions listed in the session drop-down window in RMS Express. The next thing we want to look at are the different paths that the WinLink message can take as it makes its way through the system. The paths are WinLink, peer-to-peer, radio-only, and post office. Again, the path taken is determined by the message type and the session chosen. The first path we want to look at is WinLink. WinLink is also referred to as WL2K. You'll notice that RMS Express has a group of sessions listed as WL2K sessions. This is a typical path of a WinLink or WL2K message. In this case, my friend Bob, KD7WKO, wants to send an email to Gary, AG4XO. Well, let's see how that's done. KD7WKO starts out by contacting a RMS station. In this case, it's VA3LKI, my friend Michael's pack door station in Canada. RMS stations are called radio message servers. KD7WKO uses RMS Express to pass its email to VA3LKI. If that station is connected to a CMS server, in this case Perth, then VA3LKI is considered to be a radio message server gateway because it has access to the internet and to Perth. So the email message reaches Perth. Once the message reaches a CMS server, it is duplicated out to all five of the common message servers located all around the world. And those are now gone. Everything got moved over to Amazon Cloud. So there are many more sites available that makes it, um, those five a lot more redundant than what they, you know, what they used to be. In normal operations, these servers are really the backbone of the WinLink system. As long as there is at least one of these servers operational, the system path can function. KD7WKO's email will sit on these servers until requested. The final link takes place when AG4XO contacts an RMS station using RMS Express to send and receive his email. In this fully automated process, he is connected to K4REF-10, which is my RMS VHF packet station in Knoxville. The station then contacts one of the CMS servers, in this case Halifax, and pulls down AG4XO's email and sends it on to him. So, this is a typical set of WinLink connections. It shows the pathways from and to the ham radio stations, the radio message server stations, and the CMS servers. If the internet goes down locally or regionally so that nearby RMS stations cannot connect to the CMS servers, it is still possible for the system to function. The originating station just has to reach out further to an active RMS gateway where the internet still exists. In this case, KD7WKO was able to reach out of the Tennessee Valley to VA3LKI in Canada and thus send the email on its way into the WinLink system. The next path we want to look at is peer-to-peer, -peer, also known as P2P. You'll notice that the RMS Express software has a group of sessions that are listed as P2P. 
Peer-to-peer -peer really just means person-to-person. -person. KD7WKO wants to send an email to WA4BDS, his friend Roy. All he needs to do is make a direct connection between the two radios. So, KD7WKO uses RMS Express to connect to WA4BDS and send his email message. It's called a P2P session. So, whether it's across town using VHF frequencies or across the country with HF frequencies, this type of connection is still considered a direct peer-to-peer -peer contact. The third path we want to take a look at is radio only. These could be WL2K or P2P types of connections. You'll notice that in the RMS Express software we have a group of radio only sessions. I'm often asked, what happens if the internet goes down altogether and the CMS servers become unusable? The answer is the system converts to a message pickup station path. In our example here, KD7WKO wants to email WA4BDS. The first thing that needs to take place is that WA4BDS has to tell the WinLink system which station he wants to use to pick up his emails. With the internet down, there are no massive servers available to use for storage and transfer of the enormous number of emails that normally need to move through the WinLink system. Each ham radio station will need to choose from one to three message pickup stations so that the system can store his emails for pickup. With everyone in the system choosing a different set of MPS stations, it spreads storage across the system and minimizes the transfers needed. Since all messages will have to make all of their hops only by radio now, limiting the pickup stations makes the system much more efficient. To do this, WA4BDS goes to the hybrid network parameters in its RMS Express software and chooses three stations to be used to hold his email for pickup. So when the emails go into the system from any of the hundreds of stations, those emails will make their way to the three stations that WA4BDS has chosen. So when KD7WKO sends an email out to WA4BDS, he does not have to know which stations are WA4BDS's MPS stations. He just connects to a working WinLink hybrid station and the email will be passed along to the appropriate MPS station. In this case, KD7WKO connects to VA3LKI and sends the email out. VA3LKI then copies the message out to KR4MA and N0IA, which are the message pickup stations for WA4BDS. The last step is for WA4BDS to check his email, in this case connecting to N0IA and his email is passed along to his station. The last path we want to look at is post office. This path uses a local area network or a mesh network. You'll notice that on the RMS Express session dropdown, the Telnet post office is listed. By choosing Telnet post office, we're going to choose a particular call sign and computer IP address as the location for the WinLink post office on this network. Again, this can be a local area network or a mesh network. A mesh network is one that uses wireless routers operating on amateur radio frequencies to transfer information. So, email is sent to the post office to be held there till the receiving user checks in for it, all using RMS Express. Well, now that we've looked at the two types of email messages, and the typical pathways that those messages take through the WinLink system, let's look at the modes that are used to move that email. The modes of WinLink are based on the hardware being used and the group of radio frequencies that the messages travel on. The first unique one we want to look at is Telnet. When we say Telnet, what we're really talking about is using a network, or most commonly, the Internet. In this example, my friend John, KJ4JRL, wants to send an email to my AOL account, but he wants to use the WinLink system to do it. So he uses RMS Express 
and makes a Telnet connection to the Halifax CMS server. The email goes there and then it goes out on the internet and to my AOL account. I can also use this same mode to send and return email from my AOL account to John via the same route. If John had wanted to use only the WinLink system, he could have addressed the email to my call sign k4ref at winlink.org. Still using RMS Express, he would have then passed the email to the Halifax server with a Telnet connection. The email would have resided on the CMS servers until I checked for it. When I use RMS Express to connect to a CMS server and download my email to my computer. Both of these are examples of Telnet mode of connections in the WinLink system. The next mode we want to look at is packet and robust packet on VHF. Packet and robust packet both use VHF frequencies, which are basically short distance frequencies, normally 50 miles or less. This mode uses boxes that are described as TNCs, which stands for terminal node controllers. The Cantronics KBC 9612 is a very popular example of a packet TNC. It's basically an external box that connects to both the PC and the ham radio and converts sound to and from the radio to digital signals the computer can use. With the robust packet mode, you're using a very specific TNC called the tracker that is made by SCS. So if you're using an SCS tracker, you're using robust packet. The next mode we'll cover is Pactor which uses HF frequencies. Pactor uses HF frequencies. These group of frequencies are used for long distance connections. They can stretch across the country or across the world. Pactor controllers are made by SCS and are considered multi-mode units. They automatically configure themselves to run in P1, P2, P3, and the new P4 mode of transfer. Most of the SES units are capable of using up to P3. The new SES Dragon runs in P4, which is extremely fast. One other aspect of these multi-mode units is that they can also be used to run packet mode sessions. Continuing on our list of modes, the next one is Winmore. Winmore uses HF frequencies. Winmore operates on HF frequencies like Pactor does. These again are for long distance transmissions. Winmore is actually a software based signal converter. It is built into the RMS Express software, so there is no external box. Winmore uses the radio's audio directly and then does the signal conversion in the computer. Since many computers built in sound cards don't have optimum performance for this process, an external shielded sound card is usually recommended. The most popular one is called a signal link. Additionally, you'll find other interfaces like Rig Blaster. One additional nice feature of these external sound interfaces is that they have volume controls for easy adjustments. Winmore's biggest disadvantage is that it transfers email at a much slower rate than Pactor, but the good news is that it's very inexpensive to acquire. The last mode we want to look at is the setup for post office. This mode assumes that there is a network in place to connect to and take advantage of. Post office is typically used with a LAN network, which is a local area network comprised of computers that can talk directly with each other. What happens is that one of the computers in the group is designated as the post office for the system. An email is transferred back and forth through the post office to its users. A variation on post office is the use of the new mesh networks. These networks use wireless routers that operate on ham radio frequencies and have been reprogrammed for use for this purpose. Mesh networks allow users to go wireless with their WinLink emails which can be a very powerful tool in emergency environments. So, there you have it. We've not covered all of it, but we have taken a brief overview of the WinLink email system. Specifically, we've looked at the two types of WinLink messages. 
We've looked at the typical pathways that those messages can travel on. And we've looked at the different modes that are determined by the hardware and frequencies that are chosen for use by WinLink operators. And that brings us back to the big picture view of WinLink. We hope this program has been helpful to you in understanding what the global email system called WinLink is all about. For more in-depth and descriptive information on WinLink, please go to the main website at winlink.org. You can get everything there, from current WinLink news to all the details of WinLink in the Book of Knowledge. If you want to learn how to install, configure, and operate... All right. Any questions on that so far? Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Baud versus symbol rate versus whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's that's our our limiter. And then the other limiter that we have too is, even though P4 the Pactor 4 speed is really nice, um, we we're not here yet because you know. Nobody understands the difference between baud, symbol rate, and they think they're going to lose all that CW stuff down there with noisy digital. Well, sorry, the digital stuff's here to stay. So um, until the FCC manages to get that approved and everything, um, what people don't realize is that as we get those higher speeds, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an increased volume of data. It just means that it's going to be passed along a lot faster. So you might think that you know, those areas of the bands are going to get tied up with a whole bunch of digital. Yes, but it's going to be a lot faster. So you, you might wait 10 seconds instead of, you know, two minutes for an exchange to happen. So there, there's, some, there's some knowledge there that still needs to be kind of passed along and ingested by everyone. Hey, Cliff. Yeah, in addition to him being from the South, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, he does, yeah, Rick does a lot of really good videos for the Windling stuff in addition to uh, other things too. So if you, if you go out to YouTube and search for K4REF, you'll see all of his stuff out there. Um, but, you know, as we learned in the video, there's, there's some history behind it and everything, so it's been around for a while. Um, the nice thing is that, you know, we're, we're all familiar with email. And, and we're all familiar with getting spam. Well, that doesn't happen here, um, you know, on Winlink or anything. The nice thing is, again, it's, it's time independent. So I can send a message out to somebody, and I don't necessarily have to know when they're going to uh, retrieve it or anything. Uh, and, again, it's, it's, it's not limited by that point-to-point -point propagation either because uh, by, by being able to go out to a relay and reach farther away, and, and dump that message out on the internet, and then it hits the Amazon cloud servers, gets propagated there, so that somebody else in the world can go grab that message, and, and maybe they can reach somebody locally in their town, or maybe they've got to go out a little further to connect to a gateway and pull that message down. So an example of that, two examples of that, um, in my, gate, my, my system here in town runs on Winmore and Pactor and Packet, and during MPOTA, if anybody was talking with those guys up in Duluth on the island there, I'm trying to remember the name of it. But anyway, which one? Isle Royale. Isle Royale, that's it, yeah. And so while those guys were up there, they ended up having some pretty severe storms come through Duluth, Minnesota, where a lot of their families were at. They ended up connecting through my gateway to send messages to their family to say, hey, we're okay here because on that island they had no internet service for anything. And so they were able to exchange data back and forth, let their family know they were okay, find out that towers were, were down in town and some of their equipment was, was damaged and stuff. But, um, you know, that's an example of, of how the system can be used in, you know, for an emergency communications point. Um, we've used it for some exercises with FEMA and SEMA here in town and have found out that it transfers messages just as efficiently as those expensive satellite phones they were using, the satellite communication stuff they had set up, um, the internet, and 
uh, by delivering it over phone. Uh, and by phone, I mean telephone. So, uh, you know, it's proven itself. And, and again, it's, it's widely adopted amongst the government agencies for some things. Um, we gave some of the examples. Most recently in Hurricane Maria down in Puerto Rico, you know, we, we, we read about the, the Force 25 people that went down from, from headquarters with equipment. They all left with HF gear and the SCS Pactor modems and set those up for communications across the island to get data back here to the states for, you know, requests and status and things like that. So that same system, you can use at home as you develop your emergency communications plan. And we had talked about that massive amount of data that he was, he was looking at. You know, there, just in January of, of last year, um, there was a total of 46,000 messages that went through the system there. So it's, it's a heavy hitter when it comes to, comes to MCOM stuff. And just for so far in February, it, um, as of today, it's at 43,000 messages. So it's, uh, it does get used. Uh, this is an example of, of the, uh, a logging window that I have at home that scrubs my log files from, from the gateway and displays where things are, you know, where stations have connected from on the, on the radar chart here and, and their distance rings out. So 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles. I didn't zoom it out quite far, but we've had them out at, at, at 2,000 miles in such a way. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty nice tool to have in your back pocket for things. Um, we've already decided why. We've discussed that last mile thing. Um, that slide did not update. Oh, well. We'll go past. There we go. Oh, how do you mean? Similar amounts in both directions, or is it is it is it unidirectional? Does it only go out and come back another another message? No, no. It 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 everything is exchanged just like um, between two stations. When you're sending a message, it sends a packet of information to that other station. That station sends an act back, and then. Yeah, because it, yeah, you could, you could, you could consider it that way. No, no, it's, it's, it needs an act back in order to send the next burst of information, just like packet radio does. And that's, and, and just like your APR, well, APRS is beaconing. It doesn't care if it gets a reply, but what's that? Not a lot. It's all been tweaked and tuned so that you don't, it, it, it needs to have that act in there. To, to again send that back. So yes, there's forward air correction, but it's not a lot of overhead that 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 tends to slow things down, right? Um, the maximum file size, you know, that you can attach in an email message here is 120k. Okay, not a lot by today's standards, but there's a reason we don't want to clog all the bandwidth up with these huge large fi files. But you can still pull pictures down and everything. Um, so there's some limitations of the system. You know, we talk about how, how good it is. I also like to point out it may not be, you know, uh, what you're after. But again, the message size down to 120K. You can't send zip or EXE extensions, obviously, for um, uh, malware and, and, and virus reasons and things. Um, you know, your messages will be out there for three weeks uh, before they, they get pushed off and, and, and cleared off the... Uh, the cloud servers, and then uh, you know you've got to use it once every 400 days or so. Otherwise, you'll lose your account. You'll have to go back out, set it back up again, and do your thing. So, um, uh huh. Yeah, I have dedicated equipment in my basement. It scans through channels on 40 meter, 30 meter, and 20 meters, and stops every six seconds, pulls that channel, and listens. And then once it hears a request to connect, it will stop that scan process and then start listening for a valid connect state. And then it'll send that act out if the other system receives it. It starts the automatic exchange back and forth. Kyle? What's the cost of it for generation? Yeah, so everything that is, is it's all Win, Windows-based. There's some Linux stuff out there. There's, um, there's, unfortunately, there is not a Mac or OS X client type stuff. There's ways around it, but it's not real, it, it's not something real easy to do. 
Um, so all my stuff at home is off of the SysOp programs, which you have to sign up to do on the website, and then they give you access to those download files to do it. Um, because they, they, they go through and look at, you know, various things in the area to see, you know, hey, do we need another station? Do we need this? You know, that sort of thing, so we don't get those competes. Somebody had a question over here. Do I, can I use my existing email address, or do I have to have it? No, what, when, you, when you use this system, you're, 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 when you first either sign in with either the Telnet method, which is really easy because you just you hit that server over your internet at home instead, it creates that call sign at winlink.org account for you shoot you a message back with a temporary password and you can reset it and do whatever it is that you need to do. Um, but no, you can't, you can't use this to retrieve like Gmail stuff. And you wouldn't want to because of the volume of crap we get on, on internet stuff. You know, so this is nice for you and, and maybe a group of your hams at a distance exchanging messages back and forth without the fear of spam and all that other garbage that comes with, you know, our daily life on the internet and stuff. And so as long as you don't share that email address outside of, you know, a ham radio environment, the, the likelihood of it getting picked up for anything is, is slim to none. So it, it, it makes for a really good option for keeping things down to just ham radio stuff. And, and I only hand it out, you know, mine goes out for um, folks that I, that, I, that I stay in contact with on a regular basis, and it's just strictly ham stuff. But my folks know that if they get an email message from me with that slash slash WL2K in the subject line, something bad's happened, you know. And so at least I can let mom know, hey, everything's okay here in town. So again, like when the, inter you know, if the internet drops, if, if something happens, you know, all you have to do to be able to get a message out is connect to one of those gateway stations there. And I, we'll go through the website real quick. I don't want to hold it too long because we, we actually talk more about this during class on April 28th. Um, and we've got about half the room filled up with folks now. So that's why I, I recommend everybody pre-registers um, to hold your spot there and everything. And um, that information, you can get it out at... I don't think it's out on the ARIES website yet. So if you go to n0mth.com slash events, um, the registration process is out there that you can sign up for. That way I've got a head count for um, what's going to be filled in the room. But at that class, if you've got a, a ham radio laptop or something dedicated for doing radio stuff, you, you bring it with. We'll connect it to the network there at the hospital. And we'll go through the process of getting the software loaded on your machines and then making those Telnet connections to set up your accounts so that you can go home and start working with it. You know, if you've done sound card HF stuff, it's very simple to do because that Winmore modem comes as part of the bundle for uh, the, the Winlink Express software that's there. I thought it is? Okay. So it is out on stlaries.org too for, for the flyer for the class and everything. Mine runs 24/7. Yeah. Battery backup and all that other good stuff. With there are there are there are a number of requirements that have to be met in order to host a gateway because they don't want somebody to say, "Oh, I really like that. I want to give it a shot," and then you know two months later it goes out of the system. You know, I've had mine up for four, almost five years now. But do you have to host the gateway in order to be able to use this, this system? No, you can be clients to the system. Right. Yeah, yeah. So everybody in here could go home, download that client connect on Telnet, do your thing, set your account up, and then later on you've got 400 days to check it out again, you know, and then interface it with your radio at home, with your sound card, you know, a signal link, uh, the, um, why am I drawing a blank? Well, yeah, there you go, Rig Blaster, Westmont Radio stuff, a homebrew one, I think, Joe, you've, you've used your homebrew one for, for stuff and everything, and basically it's, that it provides you an entire list of stations that, um, it, it, it knows that are you know, gateways that are available for you to use. And it's all based on what the current solar flux index is. So it says, oh, hey, based on your location, you have this, this is your best chance of 
of being able to connect to these stations and provide you that sorted list to go to. And, and nine times out of 10, you'll, you'll be able to, to pick one of those stations out of there really easily and, and make that connection to send your message out. What's that? Yeah, yeah, it just, it just does it, you know. So you pick a station out of that list, you send, okay, open session, and then it, it captures your sound card and the radio and, and does its thing. So if you've got full cat control on your radio to that computer, it'll even adjust the, the, the frequency on the radio, put everything up where it needs to go. Up to 21 days, yeah. You've got three weeks to go out there and grab it. So if, you're, if your radio's not on or whatever, it's no big, you don't leave your, you, as a client, you wouldn't leave your radio on because it's, it, you are manually pulling the system for data. Um, and, and so you have to initiate that send, you know, hey, do I, have, do I have mail or not? So any other questions? Yeah. Uh huh. Nope. Nope. Unfortunately, not. Right. And and Linux. Um, there's some Linux ones. I will go out to the website here and and I'll show you where that's at. You know the the developers are are the reason why they they concentrate on Windows is that the market saturation. The government agencies are all using Windows and all that stuff and everything. So just from a development standpoint, it makes more sense to go over that, that larger market. Not to say that you couldn't develop something, have it tested against the system and released, and then made available to everybody else. In fact, you'd be, it, you know, if you sold it for $199, you'd be a rich man by the, by the time you got done because there's a lot of need out there, not just for us, but the boaters that are that are running, you know, they're 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 energy, con, you know, constrained. So you know, they got guys out there like, hey, look, I want to do this on my iPad instead, and connect that to my my pack to our modem on my boat, and go out there and do the thing. It's not there yet. There's no client out there to make that happen. Right. So um, out on the website, on the main website there. Um, you know, under, under client software, there's the information out there for, um, where, is this mouse just, wait, there we go. So like there's Outpost, there's AML, there's Pat, uh, Packlink and Winlink Express and stuff. And they all have their limitations in terms of what they can and can't do. The Winlink Express client is the one that is fully supported on the system meaning that you have catalog access to go out there and you can pull down weather images, satellite images, um, all sorts of pre-catalog data that you can make a request to from those cloud servers and have retrieved to you. So, you know, the guys that were out on, on Isle Royale were pulling down current satellite images of weather through my, through my gateway to find out what the weather was going to be, you know, what was coming in or or if they were going to get anything else. So th those, that's the whole um, thing that they can't quite get worked out yet for that OSX and, and the other full-blown styles of that is those, those catalog requests and everything. There just isn't a lot of concentrated development to make that happen. And so when we look at, scroll down here. So that gives you an idea of where the pack tour stations are across the world. And, and, and like, likewise, any of these stations is a gateway on the network. So if you can't connect here, you might be able to get here. You might be able to get here or wherever. It doesn't matter as long as you select the next one in the list of, of uh, that, you know, when it tells you, hey, you have a good chance of, 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 of connecting here to get your message out. So on the Winmore side, which is, you know, our sound card stuff, you see things are a little more saturated for that across the U.S. So for us, it, it, that mode makes a lot of good sense to, to have around on the HF side. So if you're considering that as a technician, 
get your general upgrade, right? Um, I don't know. That's, that's about it. That's about all I got. Any other questions? Good deal? Yeah, the video is out on the winlink.org website all the way down at the bottom, that same video we just watched, as well as going out to YouTube and, and, and just doing a search for K4REF out there. And What's that one again? K4? Okay, REF. Yeah, REF, yeah.